to Simon Iscariot to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example, that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Pray with me. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Let it overflow with love. Feel my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord, let it overflow with love. Speak, Lord, for we, your people, are listening. We would do it every year during the season of Lent. It's about the only way we actually acknowledge Lent. We weren't big on keeping up with the Christian calendar or traditional church rituals. It usually happened during Thursday night prayer and Bible study. The pastor would stand up, take off his robe and shirt, stripping all the way down until he was in his suit pants and a crisp white t-shirt. He would take a towel that one of the assistant's pastors brought him and wrap it around his waist. Pastor was a big guy. 
I remember always wondering where they got a towel big enough to cover him. From the back of the church, the deaconesses, that's what we call female deacons, they would come walking out with large pans of steaming hot water. The older mothers followed behind them with stacks of crisp white towels. All the ladies were in white and had their hair tied up, wrapped in white cloth. In the dim, dank basement of my church in my childhood, where we always held our weeknight services, they looked like spirits to me. As the water came out, one of the ministers would break out in song, call and response. I want you to wash me, not my feet alone. I want you to wash me, not my feet alone. I want you to wash me, not my feet alone. Wash me, Jesus, but not my feet alone. He would sing it over and over while people lined up in the chairs across the front of the church and started taking off their shoes and socks, men on one side, women on the other. Then the pastor would grab one of the tubs of water and kneel down in front of the next in line in the church leadership, the head deacon, my dad. My dad would place his bared feet in the hot water and the pastor would rub my father's feet then take a towel and partially dry them. And then the pastor moved on to the next person in the packing order. My dad would finish drying his feet, put his socks and shoes back on, grab a towel and a bucket, and he would kneel and start on the feet in the second row. At some point in the service, the song would change. Won't you let me be your servant? Let me be like Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. All throughout, ladies were shuffling what seemed to be an endless supply of clean towels and piping hot water. I couldn't wait till I was old enough to play a role in the service. I couldn't wait until I was old enough to also get to wash feet. It was such a moving and spiritual service to see these men who were the heads of our church on their knees washing feet. And when I got old enough, it was everything I thought it would be. Every time I washed someone's feet, I could literally feel the presence of God. I felt like I was channeling Jesus and I understood the power of servanthood. Touching someone's nasty, smelly feet. I guess I wasn't as germaphobic back then as I am now. <laughs> Jesus was enjoying a meal with his friends. John said he knew it was almost his time. Judas had already made the decision to turn him over to the church police. Jesus knew he had angered a lot of people. He knew there was about to be trouble. He had to know. Anyone doing the things that Jesus was doing, breaking the laws, going against the standards and traditions, challenging conventional beliefs and understandings, pushing back against the faith leaders, he knew that if he went back, he would likely be arrested and very likely killed. Yes, Jesus knew what was coming. He knew he was in his last moments of freedom. He knew that was, this would be one of his last meals with his friends. Jesus pushed back from the table and initiated the moves, and it's imitated later, years later by my pastor and many other church leaders. He stripped down to his underwear wrapped a towel around himself. Then he filled a basin with water and started washing the disciples' feet. You can't feel like a boss when you're washing somebody's feet. I mean, look at it. You're down on your knees, half naked with your hands over somebody's nasty, smelly feet. If you were walking down the street and you saw somebody washing feet, you would not think to yourself, wow, that dude kneeling washing feet must be a king. 
That's not how things work. Somebody down on their knees touching your feet must be the lowliest of servants in your, in your stable. Yet here we find Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, God in flesh himself on his knees, wiping down his disciples, his students, his followers, dusty, crusty feet. Washing feet wasn't strange in their culture. It was expected, but usually it was the lower class people washing the feet of the upper class people. Jesus was doing it wrong, again. Jesus was getting it twisted, again. Jesus was messing it up, again. Simon Peter immediately saw the problem. No way he was going to let his boss, his teacher, his Messiah wash his feet. Uh-uh, not on his watch. Jesus may forget his place sometimes, but it was up to Peter to make sure he remembered his place at the top. You're not washing my feet, Jesus. Not going to happen. I can imagine Peter jumping up all indignant and certain that he was right. He wasn't being objectionable. He wasn't putting on airs. He really thought he was doing the right thing. He was protecting Jesus. He was protecting their movement. You can't be taken seriously as a movement if your boss is acting like the lowliest of slaves. No, no, my Jesus, you will not be washing my feet. Jesus calmly looked back at him. I imagine he smiled a bit. He loved Peter, zealous, excitable, clueless little Peter. <laughs> his flag waver, his instigator, his rock. But Peter didn't get it. Jesus looked at him and said, you don't let me wash your feet, then you can't hang with me. You don't get to be with me when I come into my kingdom. Whoa. That's real. Had to shake Peter. I mean, he dropped everything to follow Jesus, and now he was about to miss out on all the glory over washing some nasty, smelly feet? Oh, no. That's not going to happen. Peter said, well, in that case, don't just wash my feet. You can give me a whole bag. <laughs> Can't really blame Peter. Can't blame him for being confused. The washing of feet was a tradition among Jewish people. The shoes worn back then were mostly like sandals, and they walked everywhere. So their feet would naturally get dirty. The Jews were smart. They knew the dirt they carried could get them sick. So they instituted Washington. washing. You come to somebody's house, and it's expected that they set you up and wash your feet. When you're about to have a meal, at somebody's house, they set you up to wash your hands and your feet. Failing to do so would be considered inhospitable. But the host would not do the washing. They would send one of their servants to perform the sad, such a lowly task, or you would do it yourself. But here was their leader, their teacher, their hope, their promise, on his knees wiping down their feet. I would be taken aback too. And I pray that I have the strength and commitment of Peter to speak out when I am taken aback. Likewise, I hope I have the strength and commitment to recognize when I'm wrong and as quickly correct myself. Jesus tells them, I just set an example for you. If, you can wash, if I can wash your stinky feet and I'm your Lord and teacher, then you need to go wash each other's feet. If I can be a servant to you, then you need to go be a servant to others. It's another example of the paradoxes found in following Jesus. A clear case of the first being last and the last being first. And so this ritual we practice in the church, usually on Monday, Thursday, is, an, is us acting out the example that Jesus set for us. Re rehearsing again this practice of our faith. And it can be a powerful action. But washing feet is not what this is really about. I admit it's a pretty hard concept to wrap your head around. It's not just backwards, it's even more 
twisted than just backwards. It's not just reversing what we believe is a natural order, because that would still be the same thing, just in reverse order. In that paradigm, there are still poles. There are still those on top and those on the bottom. There are still winners and losers. There are still masters and servants, just in reverse order. Now the servants are on top and the masters are on the bottom. But that's the only difference. That's not what Jesus was saying. That's not what he was showing us. This isn't about what you do. And it's not about to whom or by whom the service gets done. I see how we might interpret it that way. And I, I can see how easy it is to miss the point. But I think missing it we are. Indeed. Peter didn't get it. The other disciples didn't get it. And shamefully, 2,000 years later, we often still don't get it. We show our ignorance all the time. We brag about how great we are at being servants. That's how we rate our churches sometimes. How many members you have and how much you give back as if it's actually yours to give. Our websites and Instagram posts are all about how much we do for the world. We're so great, yay us. And perhaps, And please, don't let this seem like me being critical. Well, okay, maybe I am a little bit. But I'm not saying we should stop serving. Not at all. I think servanthood is how we live this call. I think it's important to be part of the church. It's what makes us the Christian church. So please, whatever you are doing for the care of all creation, please keep doing it. Don't stop. In fact, do more. But as you are doing it, there's something I want you to think about. Now, I know what I'm about to say seems very subtle, very nuanced, and it's easy to miss, but it's really important because if you miss it, you really won't be part of what Jesus is doing and what Jesus did with and through us. If you miss it, you cannot re inherit the rewards promised to us. If you miss it, you cannot be Christian. Family, it's about purpose. The purpose of being a servant is not so that we can advance in God's eye. God isn't keeping count. God isn't tracking how far we reach. Yes, God expects us to reach out, but God isn't keeping score. I think perhaps the way John told this story might leave us to believe that. It makes us focus on the symbolism of Jesus' act. Doing something as yucky as washing somebody's nasty feet. That takes some serious humbling of yourself. Important? Undoubtedly. But I think making washing feet our focus is the evidence that we are missing the point. Because to Jesus, this was not a symbolic act. He wasn't representing some theory or concept. He was not trying to establish some new faith ritual or practice. To Jesus, serving is just what we do for each other in community. In Jesus' world model, those humanly constructed poles of class and culture and race and gender and gender identity, and whatever else we use to promote some and demote others. They don't exist. We just serve each other. We do for each other. We live for each other. And it's not just what we do. It's who we are. It's how we are. I think this is the essence of what Jesus was teaching us. And to live in it, into it is what makes us authentically Christian. Does that make sense? Think about it later. I think you'll start to see what I'm talking about. I want you to wash me, not my feet alone. I want you to wash me. Not my feet alone, I want you to wash 
wash me, not my feet alone. Wash me, Jesus, but not my feet alone. The first part of the last verse is the frame for what we need to remember when we serve. It's the lens through which we must look to focus our work properly. It's the platform upon which we all we do in service must be constructed. It's love. John said, having loved his dear companions, he loved them until the end. Jesus washed their feet because of love. He loved them so much that being their master and teacher didn't matter. Yes, he was still those things, but that wasn't what mattered. It wasn't what was important to see in this act he did was love. Won't you let me be your servant? Let me be like Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. Family, go, do, serve, wash feet, wash whole bodies if you need to, but do it not as a ritual or a chore. Do it not for bragging rights or to get a higher score. Do it because of love. It's all about love. Think about it. Wash me, Jesus, but not my feet alone. Amen.